Thank you. May be seated in the Lord's presence. We finished up our last series, which was, you know, look at the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. And so I wanted to take, um, you know, a few weeks over the course of this summer to really give us the most important study of the most important topic at the most important time in your life. And so that study is of God because the topic is knowing God. We need that more than we need anything else. There's a lot of churches you can go to that they're you know, fairly good with their Bible and you can, you can learn things about God, but you don't necessarily feel like you come away knowing God. And so that's what I want to talk to you about uh, starting today. And one of, the, one of the greatest capacities, let me start with your role in this, because the greatest capacity that you have that God has given you is the ability to choose. As a matter of fact, what I've discovered, and this is the thesis for today's study, okay? So, so, so handout, prayer diary, and then, and then prayer bulletin, right? So you, you got a prayer bulletin as you came in. That's people we're praying for. You got a prayer diary stuck inside of that. That's what we're praying ourselves. I give you the pattern for that every week. And then you've got the handout. That's what God is, that's your record of what God's going to say to you today. And that, that's stuck inside the prayer diary. So if you'll, if you'll look at that, our thesis is your chances are based on your choices shaped by your knowledge of God. So the choices you make today dictate the chances you're going to see tomorrow. And because of choices you've made in previous moments, you are who you are and you do what you do in the present moment. But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis of working that power to choose? Can I explore your experience for an explanation of what it means to select from another number of alternatives and then write out the consequences? Because what I'm saying in a real sense, and this is number one, is if you will give consecration to God first, then you can rest in the consequences. Could this be what, what causes so much anxiety and panic attacks and why so many people become paralyzed when they are in uncertain prospects? They know that they can't trust in changing consequences. They know they can't trust in changing circumstances because they do not know an unchanging God. So, so second, this number two, on the other hand, the authority to choose makes you responsible for those choices you made. So you make your choice then your choices make you. There are limits to what you can accomplish and overcome when you are loaded with the challenges of life. But there are no limits to God if you choose to know Him. So third, in the final analysis, this number three, that means when faced with a challenge, you've got to accept the obstacle as an opportunity to make the right choice. Why do bad things happen to God's people? If God were a God who prevented all your pain, then you would be a puppet, not a person. So instead, God shares his eternal purpose in his word. He tells you how to conform to his plan so that the choices you make will unite you with God. So what we discover from this analysis of the power to choose, and this is our first point for study, is that progress is the product of a process shaped by the providence of God. Progress today is the result of making godly choices in the midst of a painful process that you proceeded through yesterday. See, how'd you miss that all these years? Because choices define moments. So God gives us the power to define our moments through the choices we make. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying. Look, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be here today, but you are certainly an unconventional evangelical. And you're an unconventional evangelical because most of the churches that I go to want to keep big crowds coming by making them fall asleep on Sunday. But most Sundays at Harvest, it seems like I'm almost breaking my brain as you cause me to see God's eternal purpose, the plan of God in providence, the principles of God through his word, and the consequences if I fail to give a faith response to those things. So don't let me leave here till you show me. If my history is the result of choices I have made, how can I shape my destiny with the choices I will make as a result of knowing God. 
I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to shine the sermonic spotlight on this psalm, Psalm 118. We will clothe ourselves with this truth, get our healing. Head out of here ready to invite someone to come with you next Sunday on Memorial Day. So, because here's our second point for study. If you know God, you can imagine a destiny ahead of you. So that means life can never be over for you. Uh, nowhere in the Bible is this better illustrated than in the story of Israel's King David. David's story reminds us of the significance of choice and its power to change our lives and define our destiny. Here is David in a position of peril. He is surrounded by forces and faces and fears and foes trying to assassinate him, and yet his choice is not to lie down and die, but to stand up and live. In short, David decides not to sign his own death warrant. So not to align himself with the forces working to destroy his life, but to partner with the promise, the power, the purpose, and the protection of the person working to develop his life because David knew God. And if you know God, you can choose to stop cooperating in your own demise. Because here's our third point for study. At some point, every person has to choose to participate in your own deliverance instead of cooperating with your own demise. Life will throw you some curves. It'll take you some places you did not want to visit. In, in the words of poet Nikki Giovanni, it will leave you feeling like cotton candy on a rainy day. Nikki didn't get you. In the words of Zora Neale Hurston, it will leave you traversing the globe in fancy boots only to discover you're really just a mouse on a treadmill. Okay, okay, Zora didn't get you. Like Ozzy Osbourne, you're going to feel like you're going off the rails on the crazy train. Okay, until that, that one got you, okay. Because sometimes you survey the situation you stand in, you realize you're in a position you never planned to be in. And truth is, most of us believe that life would be a lot easier than this. But nothing is panned out the way we planned out. So, so you want to quit in mid-stroke and, and surrender in mid-struggle if you do not know God. So before you throw in the towel and wave that white flag of surrender and abdicate your anointing, and capitulate on your calling, and dismantle your hope, there is another option. Watch, here's our fourth point for study. You can decide to know God today, because knowing God is a choice. So you have a choice to make today, and you have to choose whether you will continue to align yourself with that which is out to destroy you, <coughs> or start to partner with the person who is here to protect you and preserve you. At some point, you've got to decide to know God. So David parks right in the middle of your Bible. Uh, 595 chapters before Psalm 118, 593 chapters after. Those chapters testify to the actions and the answer of knowing God. So here he paints us a piercing point portrait of imminent disaster. And he describes, in each case, his own unlikely escape. Life for David was no crystal stair. David in Psalm 118 is distressed, he is delimited, he is constrained, and this was Jesus, because the night before he died, he led his disciples in singing this psalm. Right before they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, they sang verse 17, look at verse 17, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Oh, I may die, but death does not own me. You know what? Not only does it not own my soul because I'm saved, it doesn't even own my body. So someday God is going to bring my soul back to reclaim my body as my spiritual redemption goes physical. And you may be on the crazy train, but I'm on the soul train. <laughs> so since I'm going to live and not stay dead, I'm going to declare the works of the Lord. So stop cooperating in your own demise, because today I want to show you how to participate in your own deliverance. David decided not to expire, but to live higher, not to surrender, but to survive. So how did he get there, and how can we? Anybody want to hear this? Just say, stop talking and start showing, Alan. 
And I'll even take paralysis as consent because it's just that critical. So first off, notice if you will, when you know God, and this is number one, you can say while problems pre press me, God still blesses me. Okay, I can tell some of you are still out in the parking lot. But, but David offers a reflection on the declaration that delivered him, a decision to know the God who was preserving him. And David pinpoints three pressing problems we have in verses 1 to 7. First, letter A, in my feelings. Let the whole church say feelings. Feelings, feelings can be hard to manage for anybody because we look at the facts and we are able to be deceived by the devil into discouragement by looking at those facts. So how you manage your feelings when the facts are not in favor is an important uh, uh, thing for you to master. Watch, verse 1, verse 1. Oh, here's how you do it. Give thanks unto the Lord. Watch how David knows God, starting with the permanence of God's love. For he is good because his mercy endureth forever. Well, when did David choose to get to know God? Look at verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. That was my feeling. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. In my pain I cried. I was stuck in the worst possible way. And when the Lord answered, he set me at liberty. He enlarged my coast. He brought me up in the big house. And, and that brings us to a second pressing problem, letter B. And that is our fears. He set me free from the fear I was all by myself, verse 2. He set me free from the fear I had no mediator or intercessor, verse 3. He set me free from the fear I might eventually be abandoned to my enemy, verse 4. So look at verse 4. Let them that, let them that now fear, if you're fearing the Lord, then you can say that his mercy endureth forever. When I cried, God responded by giving me more of himself. That's how God, that's what God did for me when I was in my problem. He gave me more of himself. I took my feeling to him. He showed me a fact about himself. I took my emotion to him, and he gave me a clear choice regarding putting mind over emotion. That is why David is able to speak reassurance to himself, and this is letter C, our third pressing problem about our foes. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. He speaks to his enemies. He says, God I know and the Holy Ghost I know, but who in the world are you? You guys, I don't know you guys. I know God. Because this, this question in verse 6 is a double entendre. That means it's one sentence open to two interpretations. And initially it's not meant to be rhetorical because doctrinally David is speaking in the voice of a saint during the tribulation. He's realistically assessing what, what his enemy, the Antichrist, is capable of doing against him. But that doctrine works for us in an inspirational application. Why? Because one of the things that you cannot do in life is underestimate the intent and the capability of your enemies. Your enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And after you cry to God, you'll be able to know God. And when you know God, you can take that rhetorical question, you know, what... What are all the ways they could kill me? What can they do unto me? And you can straighten it out, that question mark out, into an exclamation point by turning it into an indicative statement. Now, I know you flunk grammar. You flunked English grammar. So, but verse 6 can be read two ways, which is why it's a double entendre. It can be read like this. I wonder what man can do unto me. Ah, uh, question mark. I want to count the ways my enemy can kill me. What are they? Or, or you can read it in the indicative mood. Not what can man do unto me, but what can man do unto me? The Lord is on my side. Man can't do nothing unto me. And I don't know how you read your Bible, but I'm giving you an illustration from the indicative mood because David states in verse 7, the Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. And this brings us to our fifth point for study. 
God will exchange your praise for His protection and provision. Now, that's not an even exchange. But if you know God, you know He can make it. You ought to just turn to your neighbor and say, yes, He can. God can make that exchange. David's problems were stressing him. God was blessing him. David was willing to participate in his own deliverance by how he allowed his knowledge of God to frame how he chose to ask the question. God used the pressure to perfect him, and he now had a testimony. So on the other hand, to participate in your own deliverance, and this is number two, you need to admit the resources of my enemies are no match for the refuge of my God. Watch verse 8. And it's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. It's better to seek refuge in God than in people, politics, possessions, position, privileges, all those things can be taken away from you, but if you know God, then you know that what belongs to you is not as important as who you belong to. Because it's not what you're in that's the problem, it's what you choose to let into yourself that either defeats you or delivers you. So in verses 10 to 14, David admits, my enemies have resources. But I've discovered the resources of my enemy are no match for the arsenal of my God. So do not let enemies impede your progress because you also have an arsenal to arm you under attack. Now let me explain the rules so you know how to play. We have an arsenal to arm ourselves while under attack. In Ephesians 6, Paul says it starts with a shield of faith or, as we put it in letter A, the principle of a manifest characteristic. Watch verse 10. All nations compassed me about. But you know what? I had a shield. So in the name of the Lord, I'll destroy them. You know, uh, here's why a shield of faith is important. A lie has speed, but truth has endurance. Okay, I can see you miss that. Uh, Dr. Martin King said, truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, hoop, that is. Okay, he didn't say hoop. We said that is. David presents his problems and his problematic principalities and powers to the Lord and then acts in the Lord's name to destroy them. Second, our armor includes a helmet of salvation. And while getting saved is a choice, it is a one-time decision, um, acting from your identity in Christ, that requires you to have salvation protecting your head. So you need to not only get saved today if you're lost. Um, if you're saved, you need to make sure you walk out of here with a helmet on your head and you have it on your head every day. And David does this, letter B, through the pursuit of a monopolized conversation. He's, he's controlling what he says to himself. Watch his self-talk, verse 11. They compass me about, yay. They compass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Now that's repeated, not just because this was David's final answer, but this was David's standard answer all the time. Did you know that most of the demonic and difficult, devilish aspects of spiritual warfare you could solve in two weeks if you'd just be consistent? Why? Because if you were consistent in acting out on who you are in Christ, those demons would leave you and they would go on to somebody they could really hurt. Because the devil isn't into wasting his time any more than you are. But not only do we have a shield of faith, not only do we have a helmet of salvation, we also have the sword of the Spirit, which enables us, let her see, let her see, to have the partner of a mighty connection. Verse 12, they compass me about like bees. They're quenched in the fire, uh, quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Okay, wait. Bees are furious, but they are not fatal, and they die as soon as their stinger's gone. 
Okay, David sees that you didn't get that, so he goes on to say, fire is fierce, but the thorns are small. They, and you know what? A thorn fire dies out quick, and as a matter of fact, what you discover is the fire helped you because it turned all the thorns into ashes, and you can walk right over the top of them. So, so verse 13, thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me, so I didn't. They will not destroy me, I will destroy them. Why? Because they may thrust at me sore, but I have the word of the Spirit as my sword. This is kingdom work I'm about, so the Spirit is going to help me, because Paul says, I got a shield, I got a helmet, I got a sword, and the fourth weapon in my arsenal is prayer, and letter D, that is the performance of a merciful communication, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and song, and song is just praying set to music. Therefore, he's become my son. You know what? He was all my sal- always my salvation, but he became my salvation in this instance because in, in, if I'm singing to him, I must be praising him. If I'm praising him, then I must be praying to him. If I'm praying to him, verse 14 says, God is exchanging that praise for protection and provision. Booyah. God's not just my homeboy. God is my home base. If I can get back to God, I'm safe. My enemies can see me, but they can't slay me. They can observe me, but they cannot overcome me. So never forget the God factor. Why? And this is our sixth point for study. Because while the devil can never choose to box God out, you can. That is the power of choice. Give up that shield of faith and every dart is going to hit you. And you better believe that because... By knowing God, you can strive, survive, and even thrive. By knowing God, you can believe, succeed, and achieve. By knowing God, you will pray and stay. So do not discount the God factor, because if you do, you will believe what the devil tells about you. And you know what? The devil is such a good deceiver that he will sound just like you. And you will think that's you telling yourself. Now, I just gave you the answer. Do not stop taking your medication. I didn't say that, but, but I did just give you the answer. You need to start cross-interrogating your circumstance. You need, you need to cross-interrogate your situation. Can, you know, American Express used to have a commercial, and, you know, they would go through these other cards and how they're not accepted certain places, and then, then the guy would say, my, my card can Okay, can you make a way out of no way? My God can. Uh, Can you lift up a bow down head? My God can. Can you open doors nobody can close? My God can. Can you fight battles, pay bills, heal sickness, break habits, deliver the oppressed? When the enemy starts to stutter, you need to step in and say, my God can. The resource of our enemy is no match for the refuge of our God. So in the final analysis, and this is number three, To start participating in your own deliverance, you better recognize the destiny calling me is greater than the distractions deflecting me. And you got to see this before you go. Verse 17, I shall not die but live. And and I know I'm going to live because here's what God wants me to do with my time that I have left. Declare the works of the Lord. Wait, verse 17, you you better circle that, star it, highlight it. And write something out in the margin of your Bible because there is the answer to suicide. Choose to believe David in this psalm and say that to the devil. Because this is David's purpose. This is David's family mission statement. He chooses to establish the direction of his life. Do you feel like you're trapped and you're just going to die anyway? Then verse 27, God is the Lord which has showed us light... So, hey, what? Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Wait, once you open your eyes to the light the Lord is shining on your circumstance, then you can say with Paul, I ain't no prisoner of Nero Caesar. I am the prisoner of the Lord. Bind me to the horns of this altar because I am cross-examining my circumstance with the cross. 
and I can do that thing because the light, in the light, I understand it now. Verse 29, so I give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Show enough. Do you know God like that? God is good even when you don't understand him. God is good even when you can't predict him. God is good even when you do not discern the reasons. So I hope you get this before you go because that's why you cannot fall apart when bad things happen to God's people. You say, Alan, but that's hard. Yeah, nothing is easy to the unwilling. I'm just saying. Yeah, the ease or the hardness of doing this is strictly dependent on your choice of how to view it. Let your knowledge of God frame how you choose to view the situation you are in. That is why we must know God. My time is up. I thank you for yours. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian pray. My, we, need, we have to know God because my knowledge of God is what, what I use to choose how I view the situation. So though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, because I don't know how he does it. I just know that he does it. He keeps me. You need to know God today, and that relationship begins with his son. And knowing Jesus is as easy as A, B, C, D, A, Accept him as your savior. Accept the fact that he's the savior, not just a good man, not just a teacher. He came to be savior. B, believe on him in your heart. C, confess that with your mouth. You need to pray today and say, God, save me for Jesus' sake. So letter D, decide today that you're going to get saved. Jesus, I trust you today for eternal life. Go ahead and stand and grab your neighbor by the hand. As good as God has been to me, I need all the help I can get to sing his praise and shout his glory. Just close your eyes and thank God. Just close your eyes and thank God. Because no matter what ails you, God will never fail you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are doing in our midst. God, I pray today, move on the hearts of the lost. And Lord, that if they'll do that, move them up here to the front so they can tell me, so I can, I can give them a copy of my book on, on the next steps for a new believer. But God, also move in the lives of your people. Help us live a life that glorifies you by trusting your son Jesus and being part of his body, this church. For we ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen.